We're gonna move on to our, our next panel discussion. We're very excited about this one. As I said in my introductory remarks, we've developed a sense that one of the most effective things we can do to reduce partisan animosity is to target our efforts at young people, even before they get to college. If we can ground our young people in civic education and develop in them a sense of intellectual curiosity, humility, empathy, and a willingness to see complexity, then we can gradually change the pervasive sense that people we disagree with are bad people or trying to destroy our country. So I'm very pleased to introduce our remarkable first panel, each of whom have accomplishments and credentials much longer than what I have time to read. So I'll invite you to come up and grab a chair as I'm introducing you, just for the sake of time. Our moderator is Julia Dar. Julia is a partner at Boston Consulting Group, where she leads the firm's behavioral insights and behavioral economics initiatives. She won the World Schools Debate Championships three times three times, coached the New Zealand school's debating team to their first world debate championship win in 14 years, and coached the Harvard University debate team to two world championships. She is also a fantastic TED Talk. She has a fantastic TED Talk titled, How to Disagree Productively and Find Common Ground, which I highly recommend. Please, please uh, welcome to the stage, Julia. We also have Kimberly Willingham. Kimberly serves as the executive director of the Boston Debate League, a 2.4 million local nonprofit and one of 22 urban debate leagues across the country. Prior to leading the Debate League, she was an instructional coach working with teachers and administrators across Boston public schools. She began her career as a Teach for America Corps member in New Orleans before earning a master's degree at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome, Kimberly. We also have Norm Ornstein. Uh, Dr. Ornstein is a renowned political scientist at the American Enterprise Institute, where he has been studying politics, elections, and the US Congress for more than four decades. He is a longtime participant at AEI's Election Watch series and an advisor to the Con Continuity of Government Commission. Most relevant to our discussion today, he and his wife are the founders of the Matthew Harris Ornstein Washington Summer Debate Institute, which is part of the Washington Urban Debate League. Please welcome Norm. Thank you. Norm. And finally, we have Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, where he hosts We the People, a weekly podcast of constitutional debate. He is also a professor of law at the George Washington University Law School and a contributing uh, editor of The Atlantic. He was previously the legal affairs editor of The New Republic and a staff writer for The New Yorker. His most recent book is The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. Please welcome Jeffrey. And Julia, with that, I will turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, so good everybody. Good to see you too. We're all collectively so happy to be here to continue this conversation. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from one of the Western states. I'm from the very deep south, Australia. <laughs> um, and as Governor Cox described in his introduction, I am one of those adults whose life has been profoundly shaped by productive disagreement in the early years, by access to debate. Um, and positive conflict and role modeling the opportunity um, to express views that are different from my own and to try those on, as well as to be able um, to evolve on my own. And so it's really a privilege to be a part of that collective commitment um, today. And as Governor Cox also said a couple of years ago, um, during one of the US election seasons, um, I gave a TED talk called How to Disagree Productively. Um, and as a consequence, Thanksgiving is now my busy season. Um, I get a lot of phone calls and they all start, so I have this relative. Um, and one of the things that we wanna try and do in this conversation today is actually build on the discussion that John and Governor Cox just had this morning and begin to think about what are the solutions that might be initiatives or institution building or investments that educators, that politicians, that civil servants, that community organizers and activists can begin to make that actually mean that there aren't examples of young people whose lives have been positively shaped by debate, but that we have a collective commitment to the idea that young people's lives should and can be positively shaped by productive disagreement, by exposure to conflicting views, and the ability to really thoughtfully shape their own. Um, and there could not be a better panel to be able um, to do this. So just to architect the discussion a little bit. Um, I have a couple of questions for each of our panelists this morning. We're then gonna turn the conversation um, over to you. Um, and Kim, maybe perhaps I can start with you. We're gonna talk a lot 
Um, today, we have already talked a lot about the importance of these types of skills on college campuses, the roles of university professors. But there's also a huge body of research that says our attitudes towards difference, conflict, are shaped very early on in our life. What types of initiatives, investments, should we be thinking about for the early years, for elementary school, for middle school? Sure. So I'm the executive director of the Boston Debate League, and our mission is to prepare young people for college, career, and engagement with the world through debate-inspired learning. And we think about that happening both in the classroom and in the after-school setting. And so we run three different programs. One is after-school policy debate, and where young people are engaging in policy discourse. They are learning uh, to dig into one particular topic each year, one policy resolution each year. And they are talking about high-level complex things. Um, it's pretty exciting to see middle schoolers digging into talking about criminal justice reform or wealth redistribution or the sale of arms or K-12 funding. Uh, so we have them engage in discourse over the course of the year. They're doing research, they're questioning, they're arguing. Um, but what's really fascinating is that they're not just you know, taking one particular position, they're learning to consider both perspectives. And so that's what happens in policy debate. Students learn to dig into both. So that's one program. The other program that we run is called Debate Inspired Classrooms, because we understand not every student is going to stay after school and be on a policy debate team. But we absolutely know and believe that students across um, K to 12 need to learn the skills of debate. They need to learn how to engage in discourse. They need to learn how to listen. You know, we always talk about critical thinking. Critical listening is important as well, having a, a sense of empathy, a willingness to be curious about what someone else is thinking. And then we have a program called Resolved for Black and Latino Young Men because we saw that there were barriers they were facing to accessing policy debate. So we believe that we can build these muscles. You know, we heard earlier about um, what college students are doing and what campuses are doing, but we believe young people can develop these muscles early on. They can learn how to engage, how to listen, how to uh, live in the world from a humble place um, and from a sense of curiosity. And so we're helping them to do that. We know that once students learn how to think in this way, how to argue in this way, they're never the, the, the same. Every time you take in information, you're going to consider, where is this coming from? Is this source credible? Um, they're going to think about, hmm, is this about my way or is there another way? And so we're doing that in classrooms. We're working with over 40 schools across the city of Boston, uh, about 700 students a year, and then we serve hundreds of teachers who then have an impact on thousands of students. So um, I think you know, starting really young is important. We've had some elementary school principals saying, hey, we need to do this too. And what's really wonderful, every year we have a graduate course for educators, and we have a student panel. And this past summer, uh, during that panel, students talked about what it meant to learn the, schools in the skills in the classroom, but then use them out in the world. And they talked about playground fights, and how playground fights were no longer playground fights in the, in the way they used to be, but they're actually talking about, well, you had the jump rope this long, and if we shared the jump rope, but just really being able to apply these skills beyond the classroom space. One of the things that I think is extraordinary about the work that the Boston Debate League, a variety of other urban debate leagues do, is I mean, those are two incredibly specific interventions. One saying like we could have a pedagogy of debate-inspired learning, and that could be a commitment in any classroom, and that could include a, this really specific skill around critical listening, and that's something that we could teach in any environment. You don't have to stay after school. Like your school doesn't have to have the resources for a debate program. Those are things that you can start to infuse into the, into the classroom. Jeff, I'm curious, you and perhaps more than anyone else in this country try to facilitate high quality, constructive debates about the Constitution. And one of the things, like, as an immigrant to this country, that I think is extraordinary about it is the depth, breadth, quantity, quality um, of discussions about the Constitution. I'm not saying that the quality isn't variable. It surely is. Um, but there's plenty, there's plenty of it. There are some basic mistakes, though, in how those conversations happen. What do you think is the big error that we collectively tend to make when trying to have discussions on constitutional issues? Well, let me describe what we found works at the Constitution Center, and that points to what doesn't. The central idea in all of our debates and conversations and teaching is to ask people to separate their political from their constitutional views. In other words, not asking what you think the government should do, but what the Constitution allows or forbids. So if we're talking about gun control, don't ask, is gun control a good or bad idea, but does the Constitution allow or forbid it? 
And by inviting people to make that separation, like constitutional lawyers or Supreme Court justices, you bring down the partisan heat, you invite people to reach constitutional conclusions that diverge from their partisan positions, and you make a civil dialogue possible. So how do we do this? The core of all of these efforts is hosted on the interactive Constitution, and I'm so excited to tell you all about it, and I want you to check it out because we have all 80 clauses of the Constitution written about by the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America exploring areas of agreement and disagreement. So it just blows my mind the richness of this faculty nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. You can click on the habeas corpus clause and find Justice Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Katyal with a thousand words about what they agree about and separate statements about what they disagree about. So this is this marvelous modeling of civil dialogue. It's an incredible teaching resource, and it's gotten 70 million hits since we launched in 2015, and it's now among the most Googled constitutions in the world. Imagine then taking that model and bringing it to podcast. Every week we bring together liberals and conservatives to talk about the constitutional issues in the news. Just last week it was the Rahimi oral argument on the Second Amendment, and it was a marvelously civil discussion about the role of text, history, and tradition by two liberals and conservatives that just showed what a thoughtful dialogue could be like. There are Constitution 101 classes for high school kids that follow this model as well. And we have a new partnership with Khan Academy, the great online education provider, to bring this to hundreds of thousands of kids. I think it's really going to make a difference in the civic space. And then there are these public programs. And I'm going to give you one concrete example, because it's so inspiring about the possibility for civil dialogue if the conversation is structured in the right way. Last year, we brought together the leading liberal, conservative, and libertarian scholars in America to have a virtual constitutional convention. And this came about because we'd asked them to unite in a state of Zoom or state of nature or whatever it was to draft a constitution from scratch. All three teams, far from throwing out the US Constitution, proposed amendments, some of which looked similar to each other. For example, all three teams proposed 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices. So we brought them back together and in a week of deliberation, it was three sessions that I watched and I felt like I was watching the founders. It was that high level uh, equality of debate. They blew all of our minds by agreeing on five amendments to the Constitution. And here they are. You'll get a sense of what agreement there is in America. First, 18-year term limits for justices. Second, uh, making amendment a little bit easier. Third, making it a little harder to impeach in the House and easier to convict in the Senate. Fourth, eliminating the natural born citizenship requirement for president. And fifth, really interestingly, resurrecting the legislative veto that would allow Congress to repudiate executive actions by majority vote rather than two thirds, and which Congress exercised before the Supreme Court struck that down in 1980. What's so striking about these five proposals is first, they're about the structures of government. They're not about the contentious questions of individual rights, abortion or guns or religion that divide people. And even more strikingly, these are strong progressives and strong conservatives and strong libertarians all embracing the US framework of separation of powers, federalism, and the rule of law, and coming up with specific language to amend it. Why was this possible? What can we learn from this? I think first it was very important that we had a diversity of views. We mindfully reached out to have real liberals and real conservatives deliberating with each other. Second, I think that the, the privacy was important. The original Constitutional Convention was done behind closed doors. The fact that this team could deliberate in a week without playing to their base allowed them to deliberate. And third, these are very learned scholars who are deeply versed in the debates about constitutional text and history. They knew what they were talking about. They really thought about it and were able to jump right in and be very concrete. So there you have it. If anyone asks, you know, what do you think about the possibility for converging around constitutional principles in America? I'm the biggest optimist because I saw it done. And I am convinced that if all of us and the, and the initiative that Governor Cox is leading is, is such a model for this, mindfully reach out, bring together those liberals and conservatives, ask them to separate their political from their constitutional views, and create a platform for civil dialogue. So rather than tweeting or texting, people actually have to talk to each other for a period of time. I'm optimistic that the Constitution will survive. 
it really builds on that sort of um, social psychological research that says um, when people hear one another describe a view that they hold, they don't even necessarily need to see them, but when they hear them, describe a view um, that they hold. Juliana Schroeder um, and her team at UC Berkeley find that that is much easier to engage with, not necessarily persuasive, not necessarily more convincing, but much easier to engage with. I think that idea of separating the political from the constitutional is an incredibly important one. And as we kind of continue to tease apart that question that Governor Cox posed around how beliefs are formed, how ideas are spread, you also actually find something similar in research that says when we can get people to separate the social from the ideological, what do you believe versus what is the group to whom you belong? And without concluding, as we sometimes do, that those are the same thing, you're also able to make much more, much more progress. That's, um, that's really helpful. Um, Norm, the foundation that bears um, your late son Matthew's name and legacy also sponsors a debate league um, yeah. over the summer um, in Washington, DC. Um, and I wonder, through the process of bringing that together and being able to bear witness to that um, each year, what have you learned about what we might owe to young people? What are the ways in which we might more thoughtfully prepare young people and young adults for um, civic and civic political social participation? So uh, my uh, son, Matthew, was a national champion high school debater uh, in Washington, DC. And if you're competing at that level, each summer he would go to the University of Michigan for a debate camp. It was uh, almost like a boot camp, seven weeks, seven days a week. Uh, and it honed these skills and made a real difference. My son died in January of 2015, uh, excuse me, after a 10 year struggle with serious mental illness. And we created a foundation in his memory. We're doing two things. We're working on fixing the broken mental health system. And I'd like to talk to all of the governors uh, about some of the ways we're working on that. But we also created a summer debate camp for public school kids in the Washington area. The Washington Urban Debate League, unlike the Boston League, uh, was more abundant at the time. The Boston League is a model for the country. Um, and we started with 30 kids. Uh, these are Title I schools. They're 85% minority kids this past summer. So starting with rising sixth graders through high school, we had 200 kids, three weeks for varsity, two weeks for junior varsity, and the novices. Uh, and then they go out and form teams in their schools and they debate in tournaments throughout the course of the year, many of them now traveling. Uh, we had a couple of our kids actually win the very prestigious Georgetown Day School Tournament where most of the teams are from uh, Tony private schools and a few of the Tony are public schools. Uh, and it's an escalator up to success for these kids. I will tell you that at the end of the camp when we do a tournament uh, and then an award ceremony, and last year we got a video from Katanji Brown Jackson uh, for our kids to talk about what debated meant for her, I say I believe fervently in equal opportunity, but there's nothing equal when some people start 25 yards behind the starting blocks and others are 25 yards ahead. And our goal to start with is to get people to the starting blocks where their drive, their fortitude, their intelligence, their values can enable them to fulfill their potential. And we have a college fair where the colleges across the board flock in because they know that these kids, when they get to college, they know how to, they have life skills. They know how to speak in public. They know how to do research. They know uh, a lot of substance because it is policy debate where you dig into one topic a year. But what we have also seen is the broader value. When you go to these tournaments, you get up in a round and you don't know exactly what element of the uh, topic of the year is gonna be on the table, whether you are gonna debate the affirmative or the negative side. And so you have to be able to put yourself inside the minds of those who believe something you may find is anathema to you. And in doing that, it changes the way you think about the world. At the same time, in policy debate, you have to present a piece of evidence for every assertion you make. So these kids from an early age learn a kind of media literacy where they can separate out misinformation and disinformation from reality. And if they try to use something that doesn't fit that, they're gonna find it doesn't work for them and it's pounded into them that this is done in a civil fashion. So the value of this, 
which I hope all of you will take back to your states and do what you can to support urban debate leagues and expand them, has a, a, a value that goes beyond even what this does for individuals to give them the tools to succeed in life. Uh, the winner of last year's Matthew Harris Ornstein Award, which is not the best debater that we give out at the camp, but the one who best exemplifies his values, is now a, a freshman at Harvard, uh, having been named the National Urban Debater of the Year, uh, and we have three kids at Yale. We have them at historically black colleges. Uh, they're seeding the country, and I hope younger generations like this are going to make a, a substantial difference. And Julie, I, uh, 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 Jeff reminded me of one other thing. 30 years ago, I tried to get prime time debates in the House and Senate mm. on the big issues facing us because the Senate call, calls itself the greatest deliberative body. It is nothing like that. There are no debates. There are serial speeches sometimes. Often there's nothing that even resembles a debate. The House is no different as those of you who've been in the House know. And I thought, you know, these are not just gonna be debates that pit Democrats against Republicans. On many of these issues, they're gonna cut across the lines. And if you did it in prime time and put them out on YouTube, you would, first of all, make an institution look much better than it looks to the American public, but you would also educate people about some of the nuances and the difficulties in policy and why people have the different positions that they held. Sadly, it didn't work. We had one debate in the House, which they did as an Oxford style, but they had every subcommittee chair and ranking member speak so that they wouldn't ruffle any feathers. So it was 30 seconds here and 45 seconds there and completely disjointed. But that's something also to take back to your state legislatures. Um, Norm, I want to first thank you for the extraordinary work that you and the foundation continue to do um, in Matthew's name and the lives that get transformed through that. I thought your um, frame of saying it's an escalator um, of opportunity for people, that's, that's precisely how I, I feel about debate. May I extend the idea that you um, just proposed? How might that look on campuses? How could it look in, for example, even workplaces, but in university senates um, or in state legislatures? Um, would your request be like, we need much more opportunity to do actually the opposite of what Jeff suggested? We need many more public forums in which people can observe debate happening. And you know, we're starting to see this move out, I think, a little bit more. Um, Bob Lighton, who was a, a, a major figure in the antitrust world, a scholar at Brookings, ran the Kauffman Foundation, but also as a young child was a stutterer and it was terrible for him and he found debate and it changed his life. And he's trying to spread this through uh, public settings and we're seeing this, I think, in more places. The Heterodox Academy's idea of having debate in classrooms and some of the professors who are doing that. Debate-centered education that Kim started in Chicago and Boston together. They do it in math classes. They do it in English classes, as well as history and civics and the others. We need to try and get this done more. What we found, by the way, I also have to say, Julia, is that when you track these kids, and that's true especially of the ones who are doing debate-centered education, after they're done with it, their level of success continues. It changes their lives, not just during the time that they're doing debate. So it ought to be spread more to all classrooms, to the college level, but also it should, it's something that ought to be done in a different way. One of the things we, I, I've also been very active with a, the one committee in the House that seemed to work across bipartisan lines, which was uh, on uh, the modernization of Congress. And uh, the, the uh, chair of that, uh, Derek Kilmer, uh, who sadly is retiring now, Jared knows uh, Derek well, um, made sure, as a bunch of us got together, that instead of having a dais that had Democrats on one side and Republicans on the other, he mixed them up together. He didn't just go in order uh, and across to have comments made. He did round tables which is different than having a dais like this where you don't even look at people and then you have people sitting low uh, below you who are uh, testifying. If you change the way dialogue is done, 
it changes the way people communicate with each other, but it also gives you a much richer experience to understand where people are coming from. The whole idea of the House of Representatives was it was supposed to be meeting face to face. It's called the Congress, meaning coming together in Latin instead of a parliament, which is parler from French for speaking, was the idea that people would meet face to face and interact and debate on the floor and be able to put themselves in others' shoes. That doesn't work in Congress. It works in urban debate and it can work in other settings. Kim, I have one last question for you, and then I'm going to open it up um, to the audience. So um, Keir Steymer, the leader of the opposition um, in the United Kingdom, has come out and said, as part of the party platform, all schools should teach public speaking, um, and that this is a vehicle for economic, social, in the United Kingdom, class mobility. And would that be a request that you have for people who are shaping up agendas to say, which, as a minimum expectation, young people should leave elementary school, middle school, high school, having received a minimum amount of opportunity to cultivate public speaking, public debate, critical listening skills? Absolutely. I think if we say this is important, we have to invest in young people. And that starts in the classroom. Um, you know, as I said, not every student is going to join an after school debate team, but every single student needs to learn these skills. What we see in our public landscape is adults not practicing the skills that young people are learning. And so we want to help them to build these muscles early on. And I think there are ways that we can do that. Um, you know, in addition to using those skills academically, young people, as Norm said, go out into the world and use them. We have debaters who are representatives on the school committee. They are leading press for conferences to talk about the state of youth programming in the city. They have led some walkouts. But the good thing about those walkouts of school is that they weren't skipping. They would actually hold press conferences to talk about budget cuts and what it meant for their classrooms. So they're learning how to engage civically. And I think there are trends that we can pick up on. Uh, the Massachusetts le legislature, for instance, in 2018, passed and the governor, Governor Baker at the time, signed into law a civic education bill. And that says that all students um, get civic, civic education be, between K-12. Uh, K um, and in eighth grade, they have to do a project. And in high school, they have to do a project as well. That's one way to invest, to say our centers of education, our departments of education are going to insist that students have this opportunity. Uh, the Boston Debate League, we have an earmark in the state budget. That's a way of saying we believe in this work. We're investing in this work because it matters. And these young people are going to inform our workplace. They're going to inform our public spaces. And so I think those are other things that people can do. Um, as Governor Cox mentioned, there are 22 urban debate leagues across the country, some out this way. Denver has one. Uh, Kansas City has one, I believe. Um, so I think looking, Tulsa has one. Looking where those urban debate leagues are, how can you support them, whether that's through donations, whether that's through partnerships. We partner with universities in Boston. In fact, um, I'm excited my staff is announcing this week while I'm away that we are launching a scholarship with one of the big universities in Boston, and it is for students who have debated through our league and demonstrated leadership to go on to the college full tuition, and then they'll join the debate team there. And that's part of the expectation because this president sees the value in debate and sees what it brings to her college campus. So I think establishing partnerships like that to invest in young people, to invest in opportunities like this are key. So for those people who are making decisions here, think about how can you incorporate some of those things in your own states. And in terms of the investments that you might choose to make, the, I'm not saying that you don't have to invest in it, and you do, but that investment can tend to be relatively humble and the return on that relatively extraordinary. Julie, Questions if, I, if, for I, our, if, I, if I could just... Yes, and then I'll ask if the people can raise their hands and I'll have a microphone come around for you while Jeff makes an observation. Norm had mentioned Congress means uh, coming together and Constitution means coming together or stand together. Framework for deliberation for people peaceably to resolve their disagreements in this panel about teaching youth about a healthy conflict and in tying our work to, to the National Governor Association's initiative, we have to recognize that the idea of deliberation is under siege in America because we're living in a, some sense in the framers' nightmare. Remember, Madison comes to Philadelphia with Athens on his mind. He's afraid of mobs rising up in Massachusetts that are refusing to pay their debts. And he's afraid that America is going to go the way of Rome and Greece by succumbing to demagogues and the mob. And the whole point of a constitution is to slow down deliberation, to ensure that reason rather than passion prevails so that people can peaceably resolve their differences. It's important to 
put on the table the fact that that vision is threatened by some structural forces in America right now, in particular partisan polarization. And we're more polarized than at any time since the Civil War. And at the same time, our media is more polarized. And the idea of people thoughtfully debating the Federalist Papers rather than governing by tweet and by an enraged to engage model seems quaint. So if we're going to attempt um, as educators and public officials to promote debate, it's against the context of the fact that even getting people to agree to come together, getting the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society to agree to nominate 80 scholars to debate the Constitution, which we did in 2015, would be much harder today because our courts have become even more polarized. That's why it's urgently important not just to model debate, but to teach civics and history. And by showing why the framers embraced the ideals of the Declaration and the Constitution, in particular, liberty, equality, and democracy, separation of powers, federalism, and, natural, and, and the rule of law. Those are six big ideals that there was agreement on. As America's 250 approaches, these are still ideals that all sides embrace in principle, although they disagree strongly about how to apply them in practice. So all that's to say that um, we need to teach these principles in ways that all sides can embrace. That means bringing people and historians, liberal and conservative, together to talk about the difference between Hamilton and Jefferson on national power versus states' rights, on strict construction versus liberal construction of the Constitution, to do it in this balanced way, but all the while converging on these shared principles that make America possible. Thank you. I sometimes say when you um, want to disagree better, it sometimes also means disagreeing more slowly and more deliberately. Governor Cox, I think the first question goes to you. Thank you um, to, to all of you. This has been an incredible panel. Julie, I, I want to go to something you said in your TED Talk. There was this, you, you talked about this epiphany moment when you realized that attacking your opponent never, never worked, right? You actually had to engage with the idea. Now, just out of curiosity, I, I was just thinking about this question. Um, I decided we just released that video of the two governors, right, from Missouri and Kansas. And I thought, I bet there's some great material on this already. And so I, I went to Twitter. Um, and uh, oh, a good start. here's one of the one of the first responses to that video from Governor Kelly. This is the worst that politics has to offer. Give me insane right wing lunatics over this crap. How can you disagree better about abortion, about taxing the rich, about keeping our climate habitable for future generations, about guns shredding kids apart? This is nonsense. So one of the criticisms we get about this is um, I can't engage with those people. Like this is, this is the worst it has to offer. And so I'm curious about your journey when you figured out like attacking people didn't actually work. I think part of it, and this applies by the way in public conversation, but it also applies personally. Somewhere deep inside of us, when we engage in one of these conversations, I think we are waiting for a concession that will never come. We are like, hoping for an apology that is never coming, that people will say, this would have been glorious if it had happened, but it has never happened to me. If people said, you know what, Julia, you are so right. Like, you are exactly right, and I am exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and we all are secretly hoping that that will happen, um, and, it, it, and it's never coming. The only way in which we are actually beginning to make progress, and I thought, and Jeff, you said it beautifully, is by having a set of forums where um, people can come together. Um, I talk a lot about the humility of uncertainty, the idea that at the beginning of that conversation, you are all jointly committed to the possibility, doesn't have to be the probability, but the possibility that you're wrong or that you might evolve your point of view on something. I think it also has to start by saying, what do we agree on? Even if so far the only thing we might agree is that it's important and that this forum um, exists. There's one more request or suggestion, the um, way in which, I, just from my own personal journey, this became a um, helpful practice and one that I use a lot with executive teams, with higher education, senior leaders. Um, is for us to speak much more frequently about the ways in which we have changed our mind and the topics in which we have changed our mind. And I think it's a super reasonable question for speakers who come onto your campus. What is it that you have changed your mind about and why? I think that's a super legitimate question for media to be asking candidates for higher office. 
I think that is a really reasonable conversation for teachers to be having inside the classroom with students. What is it that you have changed your mind about and why? Because it allows for the idea that um, what I currently believe is not who I am, that my idea is not my identity, and that we are able to evolve through that. Thank you. We want to give our governors a chance to ask a question if they have any before we open up. Governor Polis. The language to tackle something like as intractable as kind of the Hamas Israel thing, right? So where do you, how do you even bring people together to have the discussion when like literally you're even on our college campuses trying to keep people physically apart from beating one another up? So like what is the kind of words and framing of how you can turn that into a disagree better situation uh, with what seemed like not only mutually exclusive worldviews, but uh, a certain virulence there as well? Jeff, I mean, as I think about some of your, um, your debates, and then I, wanna, I actually want to come back and talk about how do um, we actually, how we get pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by our younger people and the ability to deal with those types of conversations earlier than we thought. But if I think about the interactive constitution, I think states' rights, guns, abortion, religious discrimination, and political inclusion. How do you do that well? How do you create the frame? Well, just to answer the, answer the governor's question, and you know, thanks for asking the, the hardest uh, question, I, I, I wonder if you can. I mean, I, I said that we only have constitutional, not policy debates, so you can certainly have a debate about why it's important to protect hate speech and protect students' right to support Hamas or Israel, and that's a great discussion and you can converge on why it's so, that central principle that Louis Brandeis enshrined in American law, you can only ban speech if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. It's such a radical cornerstone of our ideals that it structures the debate about who can speak. But gosh, that is, um, I, you know, I wouldn't lightly uh, begin a policy debate about that. You can talk about abortion because you're not asking whether abortion is murder or not, but whether the Constitution allows or forbids abortion, or um, the same for religion. I, speech, you get into like, you know, from, from the river to the sea, that was the crux of the discussion. Yeah. And, and you know, to me, that's always strongly inferred you know, mass slaughter of the Jewish people. <laughs> I don't know what it means to others, but where, where, how do you, how do you, how do you even, that's, how, where does that fall in speech? You, but, uh, where does it fall? I mean, and I share your um, instinct that it's uh, genocidal, but I think it's protected by the First Amendment. I have, our previous panel talked about the Chicago principles, and it's really important. Let's just converge on uh, certain base principles. The Chicago principles agree that you can only ban speech if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, even saying I support genocide or death to all Jews is protected speech unless there's an intent and likelihood that that's gonna result in actual people being killed imminently. It's a very radical protection for very hateful speech, very much at odds with the way most campuses operate and deal with uh, hate speech in general, which is why there are understandable objections to the lack of neutrality in when it comes to anti-Semitic speech as opposed to other kinds of speech. But all this is to, I mean, Gosh, I, I don't know if it would be constructive, but I, at this moment for the Constitution Center, would be comfortable uh, or willing or ready to host a debate about why it's so important to protect the right of both sides to say the most extreme stuff, to try to get them to talk to each other about the policy itself, I think is above my pay grade. I, I, that's a tough one to tackle. I, I would say on some issues like this one, you're not gonna be able to find the kumbaya moment where everybody comes together and kind of uh, uh, agrees, even if they disagree. You have to, in some ways, separate out those who are at extremes. I believe in those elements of free speech. I also believe that the willingness or ability to condemn violent uh, speech or things that are beyond the norms of a society is a part of, of free speech. It's a part of the dialogue. Nobody wrote more eloquently about this than Antonin Scalia uh, on the idea of disclosure of campaign contributions. You're in the arena, and that's part of, of the price to be paid. But what I have seen in the last week or so is instances where Palestinians and Israelis come together to basically say that every life is precious, that uh, we can find ways to resolve these conflicts 
while also condemning extremists in both countries and on both sides. And I think when you bring that together, it makes it harder for those at the extremes to gain traction in a debate. We have to recognize that we're not going to be able to resolve some differences where people are hardened in. But the rest of us can try and find some way to isolate them from the broader uh, society and the dialogue that can lead at least to some path to resolution. Kim, one of the things that encourages me about urban debate leagues is the maybe surprising ability for people surprisingly younger than we expect to be able to contend with really complicated sure. issues. And other than practice, how do you help give people the language that the governor is asking for? Well, I think there are a couple of things that are really powerful about what we're doing with young people. One, we're bringing them together in community. And it's not perfect, um, but one of the things that we do do is talk to them about one another's humanity. So we, we grapple all the time with dissenting voices. What do we expose young people to when we prepare evidence packets? What should they read? And we want to both protect them, but we also want them to know this is the real world. So one, we want to teach them to weigh sources. Where is this coming from? Who said it? And why? And then as they argue with one another, one of the things that we often tell young people is you're not attacking a person, you're attacking their argument. Um, and, and then when you're attacking their argument, do so not so much from a place of, I've got to win this debate, right? Winning and losing is great, but personally, I don't care much about that in the world of debate. I know that there are people who are different. Other leagues are very much more focused on competition. I'm focused on skill acquisition. I want young people to develop skills that they can use in the world. And so we want them to ask why. And so when I think about our Debate Inspired Classrooms uh, program, for instance, we're modeling for teachers how to have conversations with students. So one thing that we might have teachers do is, ask, tell me more. You say, tell me more, why did you say that? What makes you think that way? What evidence do you have to support that? And so I think those are the things that we're doing in community. And what's really nice is we've had students say, that's my friend across the room. It could be a large auditorium. They just argued against one another, but they've come to see one another's humanity in this space. They've come to respect one another. They know you've put in all this time all year like I have. You're passionate, I am too, and we agree on some things. And so I think just really creating spaces for young people to see one another, to be willing to listen to one another, and, and really coaching them to not be right, um, not think you know everything because none of us do, but really I'm listening not to attack and to respond, but I'm listening so that I might be able to learn more. And there's a wonderful quote, and I can't remember now who said it. Um, it appeared in our Massachusetts Common uh, Core framework some years ago, but it was talking about the purpose of debate. And it's not about winning or losing, but really the ability to persuade people, to get people to think differently. And so to consider another side, and I think that's really powerful work that happens in urban debate leagues. You know, one of the most heartening things that I've seen in our league is you'll get uh, experienced debaters in the middle of a round who will stop and tell the less experienced ones that maybe you should frame your argument this way, you'll do better. Mm. That there really is a desire to bring everybody up, just uh, as uh, Kim has said. I think, that's, I think that's beautiful, that transferring of skills and knowledge between one another, not just the transfer yeah. of ideas. Is there another question? Right here in the middle. I wonder if in the spirit of disagreeing better, I could challenge any of you to take on a counter argument to the premise of this discussion, which would be that the problem is not that fair-minded people of the left and right are not disagreeing well, but rather that the in-groups of each side are failing to maintain standards of discourse and democracy for their more radical fringes. That the, the right is not holding the radical fringe of its own party or even its leadership to standards of maintaining respect for democracy and that the left fails to address cancellation mobs on its own side. That's I'll, t I'll take that up. Uh, I, the, the argument would be this, that uh, there, is, there are core principles of the American idea embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which include liberty, equality, democracy, separation of powers, federalism, and the rule of law, and that extremes on both sides, as you just said, are rejecting that framework instead of embracing the idea that the meaning of all of those values is produced by civil dialogue. They're 
embodying the kind of factions that Madison devoted the entire system to avoiding. And a faction is any group defined by self-interest rather than the public interest devoted to uh, economic or class or ideology rather than the common good. And uh, we're seeing both sides exacerbating uh, precisely those dangers. And as a result, the system is dangerously under siege. I'm not sure that that's a, you know, it's not a criticism of the idea that it's important to teach youth about healthy conflict, but it suggests that simply having debates as crucially important as it is to model them is not gonna solve these structural problems in our democracy. And let's just acknowledge the obvious fact that these are deeply challenging times for democracy. By some measures, we're more in danger of violence and democratic breakdown than at any time since uh, the Civil War. Um, and uh, there's no easy solutions to that. Although I will share that out of all the task forces and discussions that we've hosted with liberals and conservatives to try to address the democratic deficit, there's one concrete suggestion that people are converging around, and that is ranked choice voting, as it happens. The idea is that a less, I see some nods in the, the audience, a, a, a first past the post system is, is contributing to our polarization and having um, uh, a, 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 a ranked choice voting might alleviate that. But it, it's a good uh, caution to, as, as we begin to wrap this up to suggest that the breakdown of our discourse is not the cause of polarization, but a symptom of it, that polarization is a grave threat to uh, democracy, and that it's really important for us to substantively defend the liberal idea, the American idea, the ideas of the Declaration and the Constitution, which, as Jefferson said, are self-evidently true. Well, I wanna just take that on a little bit, too. Um, I had a, a disagreement with my uh, former uh, president, Arthur Brooks, who many of you know, who said, you know, everybody's a good person, we can all disagree, but they're all good people. And I said, no, there are some evil people out there. And what we have to do is try and uh, make sure that they are not considered to be a part of the common discourse, not by uh, saying you can't speak, but by condemning them. We live in an age of not just polarization, but tribalization. And in a tribal environment, you are reluctant to criticize anybody in your tribe because that gives aid and comfort to the enemy. And we can't let that go on. There are some who are beyond the pale in what they recommend or what they say or what they want to do in the society. Many are afraid to speak up now because of a fear of physical violence if they attack some of their own. And we have to create a different kind of environment. And it's an environment in which the overwhelming majority of us are good people who may just disagree. But if we don't start to condemn those who are at the extremes, then they are gonna gain more traction and it's gonna make this task a hundred times more difficult for all of uh, the governors and the rest of us who are trying to create a different environment in the, in the society. I'm gonna close out our panel today. Um, one very, I'm gonna request a very brief response from each of you, the people in this room of money and platforms and institutions um, and policies. Um, what requests do you have for them as they think about what 2024 looks like, what an election season might look like, what a new academic year might look like? Sure, um, engage young people. Um, don't count them out. Don't think that they don't have anything to say. Don't think that they're not interested in learning, but engage them and invest in opportunities to have them um, participate in our democracy, learn how to do it, um, and, and engage in argumentation. Thank you, Kim. No. So some years ago, I tried with Sandra Day O'Connor and Ken Burns to create a series of contests in states for school kids at all levels to do a little essay on one thing that would make the society better or make the government work better at any level. People love contests. Every civics teacher in the country would just jump on this and have uh, different levels where in the end you bring winners to the state capitol to meet with the governor, with the legislatures. Some of these ideas may be ones that we would never have thought of. And there are ways in which you can start to engage people in the uh, questions facing the society, even at the elementary school level. We're starting to take debate to the elementary school level now. They're smart as could be. Some of these kids could really teach us something. 
and it's wise to find ways to bring them in. Thank you, Noel. Jeff. As we talked about, Constitution means come together, and there are really exciting efforts to come together around America's 250, uh, the, the National Governor Association effort, uh, along with those of many other groups, uh, is attempting to bring together liberals and conservatives respectfully to embrace and explore the American idea. And that will involve a series of national convenings on all platforms, a great education effort, and also the chance to hold at least some of them at the incredibly beautiful National Constitution Center, which is right on Independence Mall. I just want to put in a plug for the space. It's the most inspiring constitutional space in America, overlooking Independence Hall with the words of the First Amendment shimmering behind you. It just blows my mind every time I'm in it. So let's have some of those convenings there and take them across the country and inspire our citizens to come together around the American idea. Constitutional celebrations at Jeff's house. Um, let, me, um, let me close in this panel both with an appreciation for this um, conversation, but also my expression of hope um, for what happens after this, which is I think there will be investments and initiatives and policies that come out of this. But the thing that we could all do every day, every conversation, is start asking people, what are you changing your mind about? And allow that discussion to continue to evolve um, in our families, on our campuses, in our societies and in our politics. We really look forward to being with you for the rest of today. Thank you very much. <laughs>